Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our session for today. I'm absolutely delighted to be welcoming Lindsay and Verity from the University of West of England in Bristol, who are going to share all about the work that they've been doing and this very important um, concept of resilience amongst our young people, which school libraries have got a key aim for doing um, work around. They have been very generous and sent print copy books of the um, publication that they've produced um, out to people, uh, but it is also available online. But um, I don't want to steal their thunder. They are going to tell you all about the work they've been doing, all about how you can make use of this in your school library context. Um, so I will hand over to them. But as I say, any questions at all as we go, pop them in the chat um, and I will field them later. So over to Lindsay and Verity. Thank you for joining us. Okay, Perfect. just uh, just to say hello. Um, I'm Lindsay McEwen. I'm a geographer. I work at UE Bristol in the Centre for Water, Communities and Resilience. And Verity, my colleague. Verity, do you want to in introduce Yeah, you? hi, I'm Verity. I work in the School of Education and Childhood, which means part of my job is um, doing the teacher training on our PGCE and our undergraduate with um, qualified teacher status. And I used to be a teacher. <laughs> OK, so what we've done is put some slides together to tell you a little bit about the project that the book is based on, just as a background context. And then the bulk of what we're going to talk, be talking about is about actually about the book and how it might be used. So, um, yeah, so let's let's get started. Um, so we as part of our our research in terms of uh, this webinar, we did have a look to see the role of the school library and the school librarian. And we drew this down from the um, SLA website. Uh, it was useful for us just thinking about the wider role of the school librarian. Um, and we welcome your feedback on this, um, this group uh, in terms of how we engage, you know, as we, as we, as we discuss the book going forward. So, so it's a question for you really about your role and how you see yourself uh, within that context. What we want to do um, initially is just to set the scene for the book. Although the book was produced during the pandemic, one of the things we recognised as we were going through was that it actually provides um, a background resource for dealing with other sorts of social shocks, whether that be climate change, whether it be austerity, whether it be war. And so we're keen that we think of the research in that wider context. We also, when we were discussing this and, 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 and our work more generally, reflected on the tension be between um, the, the, um, the narrative around uh, children as, um, as resilient and trying to ensure children are resilient with the fact that um, quite often we're not listening to the child's voice. And that's particularly the case within the COVID inquiry. There were a number of organizations, including ourselves, that petitioned for the child's voice to be involved in that um, that review and that's as you know that's ongoing as well but also when we look at at climate change um, then there's a, again there's it's really important we've got another project running at UE called CCC Catapult which is very much about um, the young person's voice in the climate crisis and here just we're just uh, on the slide here mentioning that um, that climate change and sustainability in education very much on government radar and indeed, uh, the schools are going to be asked to or required to produce a climate change plan uh, by 2025. Verity said that many schools aren't aware of that yet. So I just I've been asked to put that caveat, that caveat in. And Verity is happy to talk to that as we go through. So if we look at the voices in the pandemic project, um, it was given the short name VIP Clear. Uh, you can a bit more about that on our website and the links are at the end. But the important part of this was, was a focus on children as unheard voices in the pandemic. Um, and so it was around exploring their worldviews, uh, their experiences, particularly of socially disadvantaged children. And the next slide tell you a little bit about the schools we work to. But not only were these children unheard, but also they were having undue impacts during the pandemic, um, not necessarily because of the virus, but because of the mitigation measures. Indeed, that's coming out in the COVID inquiry. And so what we were um, trying to do within the project was to learn from that experience from the voices of the children. 
and to use that in the preparation for present and future social shocks. Now, the project was uh, funded through the Arts and Humanities Research Council. It was supposed to be an agile project. I think it broadly was in that we had to um, we had to respond very quickly to the situation. It was an interdisciplinary project. So I'm a geographer working with Verity as in primary education. We had somebody from health. We had somebody from science communication and so on, environmental psychology. And it was and the project was delivered in partnership with schools. That was challenging times trying to deliver a research project during COVID pandemic. But we worked very much in partnership with four primary schools in a longitudinal way. So it was repeated visits to those schools. We did also work with other partners there and probably most noticeable there is Action for Children, which is a national child children's charity. So they were an ongoing partner. Okay, so in terms of our process, what, what we played out with the children was uh, what we called a creative diary process. So we didn't just go in once and, and do an activity with them. We went in over 12 months and the, we started our process after the third lockdown. And so what we did there was we that you can see the sequencing there. There, were, there was more than one phase in each of these um, activities, but deep mapping, um, photo elicitation, and then trees of hope and ambition. And the important point about this, which was very participatory, it was child-centered, it involved art and conversation, uh, the children sharing back what they were drawing and so on. So that was a really important part of the process. And if we just look at a couple of those stages, that in the deep mapping process, we see there the first part was asking the children to map your world at this time. And as, as Verity will share a little bit uh, later on here, we got a whole series of interpretations of that. That one plot you can see there of a nine to 10 year old shows how detached things were during that, uh, during that time. But that was looking back. We also, and a really important from an ethical point of view, asked the children to look forward as well. And that's where we developed the tree of hope and ambition. The upper part of the tree there is around the children's hopes and ambitions for the future. And we, they told us all sorts of things about what they what they were aspiring for, for themselves, for their families and so on. But very importantly, they also indicated what their support needs were. And those support needs gave a child's insight into the how they perceive support as rather different from what you might get from an adult being asked the same question. We produced a whole series of outputs of the project and we're still doing that. That's the nature of research projects. It takes quite a long time, particularly with research papers and policy documents to get them fully, fully out and embedded. But most critical, if you're looking at this megaphone, is that the, the picture book that we're talking about today is closest to the child. And so it's an opportunity for us to share the child's voice, some of the themes and things they told us, but also to integrate some of the methods that we were using, the deep mapping, the tree of hope and ambition as, as part of the storyline within the book. Before I hand over to Verity, just to share, I mean, what we've been doing is impact work subsequent to the book being produced. And so we've been working with other um, organizations that work with children. So this resource that you're looking at today is, is hosted on the Bernardo's Education Community Platform. It's also been promoted by the National Children's uh, Bureau as well as regional players as well. So that's the part of the spirit of sharing. It's a free resource, it's available online, but also, as we said, we've got limited hard copy as well that we're very willing to share uh, where it can be put to good use. So I think that uh, my quick resume there, if you've got any questions, I realize I've covered stuff quite quickly, conscious of the time, but um, we can move over to the, the detail on the book now. So it's over to Verity. Brilliant. Thanks, Lindsay. And um, thank you, uh, Helen, for popping in the chat the link to the digital copy of the book and also the teacher's notes. So if you wanted to kind of click on that now, feel free. But I'm going to kind of go through the narrative shape and link and, and, and trying to kind of unpack what the story is about and perhaps kind of some more critical uh, uh reading activities that can go with that so i think as lindsay said what's really important is not only did we do the research and listen to what the children said we then worked with an artist lucy goral barnes uh, who's also part of the research team 
and uh, brought together the voices of the children in order to then present a hopeful narrative um, uh, about resilience so that children, parents, teachers in schools could use this as a, as a gateway, as a, as a way to hook children into thinking about um, times of distress or time, you know, difficult times where things are happening uh, and then open that up. Because one thing we found when we were going in during COVID and since then, we've been into a lot of schools to use this book and find out how people are using it. And I'm talking to the children during COVID. That was very much uh, the, 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 the context of what they were thinking. You know, it, it, that, that was on their minds. But as we were coming out of some of the lockdowns, we were going in and talking to children. And actually, that wasn't at the forefront. We were having waves of, of, of concern. So uh, the wave of the concern was climate change. And then uh, a wave of concern was the war when the war in Ukraine started. So constantly our children are dealing uh, and, and our young people are dealing with all of these issues. And what we hope is we've um, used and the feedback is that it kind of works. Yeah, so, so that's great, is that we've used a, a metaphor for uh, kind of times of crisis, times of social change, um, of fog monsters, and that will help uh, be able to use it in kind of multiple contexts. So Learning to Live with Fog Monsters is a free book and it's got free um, teaching activities, free notes as well. So Lindsay, could I have the, the yeah. So the context, the world of the book is this space where um, you, you, you can see these kind of houses on ladders. Uh, and that's because this kind of invisible threat of the fog comes and we have to kind of be out of it in order to, 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 to be safe and to survive it. And if you kind of get stuck in the fog, then that's a problem. So it's kind of a, dy a, a children's dystopia. Um, but upon that the narrative is very much uh, kind of hopeful and the story begins with a siren um, and the siren goes off to indicate that the fog monsters uh, or the fog monster is kind of coming and and will be amongst uh, amongst these buildings um, and talking to the children and the young people who've read this they instantly got this siren this alert uh, some children said oh crikey that's a bit like uh, in the war when the air raid shell the air raid sirens went off whilst others were saying oh that's like a fire alarm um, and and more recently whilst nobody's mentioned this yet i, I wonder whether this will come up soon so the, this last week, uh, we've had uh, the bomb in, in Plymouth that was found uh, and immediately uh, people's phones went off with the government's warning. So we're constantly aware of these sirens going off. We're aware that something's happening, that something's not right. And that is our context. So um, if we could just pop on to the next slide, the story is around two children and their journey and that kind of narrative arc so we are going to see the kind of the ups and downs of children trying to make sense and trying to find things that they can kind of hook onto that they can find hope in and that they that they can kind of uh create resilience around themselves in this time of, 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 of potential crisis and in the teacher's notes, I'm just going to mention this. On the first page of the teacher's notes, um, we do a page by page question, uh, questions to ask learners and support critical reading and recognise intertextuality. Now, I'm sure teachers within, uh, within the room today are amazing at this. But for those teachers who perhaps aren't as, uh, as savvy as others, um, we found that this is, can be really useful. So each page within the uh, teacher's notes we've gone through and we've we've put questions so for guided reading it might be really helpful or for a class read just to give some support on things that uh, might be useful to pick out you have the next slide Lindsay thank you so as I say here is the beginning of the book we've got that that context and we've got two uh, children we've got Arlo and Layla and um, it sets up this image of a child who's on their own they're in a, a, that they live just with in a single parent occupancy, whereas the other child, Layla, this is Arlo, Layla lives in a um, 
in a uh, house of multiple occupancy, really squash. And the, the, these were what we were finding from the children we spoke to, children who were quite lonely during times of crisis and children that had so many people in their, their lives and that were kind of crikey, we just want some space. So we tried to show that. And for those children, uh, for, for many children, animals were a real significant part of how they made sense of and who they went to, to 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 reflect on what was going on. So I don't know whether anybody can spot in here in the text. It talks about, you know, oh, I wish I had uh, I wish I had a pet. And our artist, Lucy, has secretly popped in a cat. Can anybody spot the cat? Just have a quick look, see if you can spot it. And perhaps in the chat mention, some, someone's cheating with their little, uh, is that you, Lindsay, <laughs> pointing it out? <laughs> You're absolutely right. If you look at the judge, yet yeah, that there it is, there's the cat. So the cat is that kind of shaded uh, section. So it's this kind of hidden, it's, it's something that the child wants. Can I have the next slide? Brilliant. So the, the, the narrative is that the children, um, it, it's, it's kind of locked down, they're, they're, it's not at school, they don't know um, what, what's going on really, and they're, they're looking to see and they're finding different things that are supporting them that they might not have noticed, that they that, that perhaps even overlooked previously. So they find things like free football sessions or cycling clubs or, or all sorts of different things that would be able to help them um, and, and think about what is going on in their local community, what are the things that kind of help support them. They're not on their own. They are connected to all sorts of things that they might not have thought about. Next slide. And that links very much to what the children were saying in our research and this kind of idea of, you know, if we start with a child in the centre and we go out, then you can actually map um, and we call it their awesome plan and we can map uh, the significant people uh, and the actions that can be taken um, as, as we go further and further from the child. So close onto the child is parents and the local community and the school. And as we go out further, we've got things like, uh, as we say, powerful people that need to listen to us. And as we go through the book, uh, Arlo and Layla, they collect things that they put onto their awesome plan about how they can um, create a more resilient space for themselves. Next slide. And as Lindsay mentioned, we really do embed into the narrative um, some of the methods that we used with children. And then we take those. So, for example, the tree of hope. And we take those and we also put them into action in our uh, teacher notes. So here we've got part of the narrative is that the children, they see a cat and they follow the cat into a wood. Um, and I really like how we've turned and disrupted perhaps what a lot of children consider to be woods, especially within fairy tales. You know, quite often woods are seen as scary spaces. But in actual fact, during lockdown and certainly when uh, for, for our well-being, we know that being with nature is really important. We know that that was really important for the children that we worked with. And lots of messages came out around the importance of being with nature uh, and, and our daily walks. Do we all remember our daily walks that we used to have to take those routes? Um, so part of the narrative is that the children find this tree of hope in the woodland and on that are messages from people about what you know what they want i want climate change to stop i want to be good at skateboarding it might be something really, you know stop war i want to make a safe place for refugees i want to get better at handwriting all sorts of things um, you know, with the disruption of COVID, lots of children missed out on things like learning to swim, um, uh, missed out on uh, getting their pen license in the usual time that they would. So swapping from pencil to pen and things like that. These were really important, as well as not being able to go to people's birthday parties. Crikey, we heard a lot about, you know, missing these significant uh, times. And having that space to reflect on what we want and what we're missing, whether it's something really big and important or something that actually we would usually take for granted is really important. Next slide. 
What was also significant, and we, we, we make uh, quite a, a bit of that as part of the narrative, is the relationships with significant people in our lives and how caring adults in children's lives are really important as part of their resilient package. So here we've got one of our protagonists with mother. We've also in a, an, another section got uh, um, the relationship with uh, a, a grandma, uh, a, a nan, and just showing the importance of these figures uh, was also significant uh, to both the narrative and to the research. Next slide. So at the end of the story, the Layla and Arlo, they, they find all of these things that they're going to put on their awesome plan and how they're going to kind of make sense of the fog monsters. And then in the end, um, they bring it all together and it is a happy ending because the community, they, they, they write letters to powerful people. They get friends and teachers on board. Um, they're part of a cog. It's not just them pushing things, but they see themselves as part of a wider community um, that, that can, that can uh, bring resilience, bring the community together, which is all so important. And so here we have that kind of celebration and this is their second awesome plan. So look, look what they've managed to do. Um, and, and that that is sees signals the end of the story. Next slide. So having got that story, we have got the teacher's notes. And as I say, um, we've got the, uh, the, the teacher's notes link there. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, we, are, we, we just want to highlight some of the challenges. So as practitioners in schools, whether you're librarians or teachers or SLT, it's always good to know what we found as to be some of the challenges. So access to resources, as we know, um, budgets are tight for many, many educational settings. So everything is free. Um, you can have free uh, electronic resources of both the book and the teacher's notes. If you would like a hard copy of the book, then we can also send those out. And I know that we've sent some out already uh, to some people uh, within this network. So please get in touch if you'd like that. We also recognize that um, resilience and well-being and all of those issues, uh, it's important that we work with appropriate stage and age with appropriate resources. So from the work that we've done, we recognise that this uh, particular book works really well with upper key stage two and lower key stage three, um, particularly vulnerable children. Those are the, 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 the children um, that, that it works really well with and um, is a really good perhaps at transition times. So when people are feeling a little bit wobbly anyway, um, this could be a, a great transition um, transition book. Um, when we have done activities with children, um, we found that quite often they read the book and then we do an activity with them. And whether it's in a library or whether it's in a school, um, children quite often uh, open up. So um, it's really important that uh, whoever's delivering this is aware that children might do that and that they are aware of their safeguarding procedures. Um, so it was just to kind of highlight that as a potential challenge for those people who are delivering. Next slide, please. So the children, the, the, not the children's, the teacher's notes. Um, as I say, we've got that page by page questions to ask learners and support critical reading. And then we've got 10 activities and all of the activities are um, curriculum linked. Um, and they um, follow everything from art to music to uh, English, um, all sorts of different, there's music activities as well, all sorts of different activities within that, uh, with the 10th the, the um, activity being to create an action plan or the children in your class or group's own awesome plan. And it, can and it takes you stage by stage through there. We're not going to uh, dwell on all of these because we haven't got time. So we thought we'd just mention two of the activities, which are very much linked to um, those research methods that we used and that you've already seen as part of the narrative. And now you can see um, that they are also activities you could do within your setting. So next slide, please. 
So the first activity is mapping your world. And I think you saw um, with Lindsay earlier that as part of our, uh, our initial research, we wanted the children to map their world at different times during lockdown. So this activity it is just that. We give learners a blank postcard and we found that a postcard is a really nice size. If you give children an A4 or an A3 sheet, it can be really intimidating. So a postcard is a really nice, not intimidating size. Uh, we encourage people to map their spaces and their places. Um, and it might be that they use emojis, they might use words, they might use uh, drawing. We really encourage, and what we do, we really encourage a really inclusive approach um, so that people can communicate how they want to. And we found that that's really interesting. So this links really nicely with a lot of the geography uh, kind of uh, modeling and map making. So next slide. With all of our activities, we provide supporting questions and prompts. So key questions that you can use. And um, whilst you are one member of staff in your setting, we really hope that you'll be able to cascade down the kind of activities that are on offer. Uh, and you, you might be aware that, oh, in year four or in year seven, they're doing such and such. And have you thought about using this book? So we really hope that you'll be able to cascade down um, and, and recognise, hopefully, that these are useful um, resources. So, yeah, we've got key questions to ask. Um, and then from that, the children create a little map. So uh, next slide. Here are three examples uh, from mapping. You've seen one of them already, the top left. Um, and this, these were done during, uh, during the lockdown. Um, so uh, top left, you can see, I really like the, the harbour side circular walk. That's very, uh, <laughs> that's very reminiscent. And then we've got the Aldi shop, homeschool learning and their house, all very separate, um, very, you know, not really connected. If we go down to the bottom map, um, this is uh, um, an activity where you've got the postcard to begin with. And actually, um, this is a, a, a few months later, adding to that postcard. So in the activities, we've also got follow on activities that you might do. So you might have the postcard to begin with. And then a few months later, you might go, return to that activity, pop the postcard on a bigger sheet of paper, and then they add to it and uh, kind of think, OK, so how has my world changed in the last three months? Or how has my world changed since the beginning of term? And you can come back to those activity and really think about um, what, what's happening in the world and what's going on. Now, the top right uh, postcard we thought was really interesting as researchers because this is the Titanic sinking. Now, I think this indicates how it's always so important to talk to children about what they're doing, because as a metaphor for lockdown, I don't think you could get much better. I'm sure many of us felt that we were, you know, lost at sea, that everything was in chaos and we couldn't get to dry land. And it works really well as a metaphor on talking to the child about this. No, it was nothing to do with that. They actually did a self-led learning project on the Titanic. They thought it was absolutely brilliant and were totally obsessed by it. So that's why it went on their map. For them, their world was totally Titanic. So um, really important to talk to children. <laughs> Next slide, please. So as I said, um, with each of the activities, we take it further. So you've got ideas of how to extend what you're doing um, within this particular activity, we linked the Royal Geographical Society stay at home stories uh, and invite children to map their homes and uh, people can add to that if they want to um, or even perhaps uh, change it a bit and collect different noises rather than uh, rather than um, looking at uh, visual cues. So all sorts of different ideas. So hopefully if you wanted just to dip in and out and use it as a 20 minute warm up for a lesson, or if you wanted to actually use it as the basis for a more longitudinal um, uh, look at how uh, children's uh, relationships with places are changing across a term or a year, then these activities will help that. Next slide. Um, another activity that we've already spoken about are trees of hope. 
Now, as this is the School Library um, Association, we thought that, that this was a really nice one because I go into so many schools and quite often in the library or in a, in a space perhaps uh, within the reception area, they have a tree and it might be a poet tree where you, you um, hang poems on, but we've got our tree of hope. Um, so thinking about you know, you, using perhaps a small piece of cardboard, as are just small pieces of cardboard, what is it that children are hopeful for? What is it that they might really want? And thinking at scale. So when we when we did do this with the, the, the children, um, we, we um, provide them with that outline of the tree. So you, you can do it uh, very much on 2D. And as part of the notes, you've got a photocopy of the tree outline. Um, and then children can add different things to the different branches of what they want. And what we found is quite often, well, it depends actually, some children go global scale immediately you know, what is their hope? We want climate change to stop. We want ocean plastic to be diminished. We want uh, the war in Ukraine to stop. They, they go global immediately. Whereas other children go very much local. And that might be, I would really like a pet or, you know, something's going on at home or um, uh, I'd, I'd like to have a bedroom, not having to share with my little sister, something like that. And then encouraging the children to think at different scales with their trees of hope and then connecting those two. OK, so if we if we want this to happen, how might we be able to support that change? And that's really difficult because that's quite abstract for children who don't know how things are necessarily connected. Um, but that's, the, you know, the role of. Um, the knowledgeable other, uh, the teachers, the librarians kind of guiding and supporting young people to think, OK, you're not on your own in thinking about wanting these changes. Here are all sorts of organisations that might be able to help and are doing things already. And here, you know, perhaps we could write to this organisation or we could write to our local MP or we could write to our head teacher or we could have an assembly for parents or whatever it might be, so that we can start thinking about how we can action children's agency. Uh, so that is that activity. Next slide, please. Lindsay, next slide. Uh, yes, I'm afraid it's frozen. Uh, oh, this is what sometimes happens with this. Uh, if it's been sitting here, oh, we are we back. Are. So there it's back. Go. I think it's over to me now. Yeah, yeah I'm going to hand over to you. OK, so, um, yes, uh, thanks very much, Verity, for that. Um, what we want to do now is just to highlight the website. Um, here, there's um, a whole series of resources, including the book as downloadable copy or as an online book. There's the teacher's notes. There's all sorts of resources for the activities that we've been describing, the deep mapping, the tree of hope. There's other mater material on trees and um, their connection with cultures, you know, rag trees and so on. So that idea of hanging things on trees and wishing. Um, so it's worth having a look at that. We're updating it as other resources come out um, from the project. We also just wanted to take the opportunity to highlight another couple of um, well, actually three books. We've, we've mentioned the VIP Clear, the Voices in the Pandemic book, just to note that it got a highly commended there from the it, that was from the Geography Association Publishers Award. But both Verity and myself, the first time we worked on a primary book indeed was uh, for the Drought um, Dry Project, Drought Risk and Use. So we have another book, which is also key stage two, which is about a hidden risk, a very different hidden risk. Um, um, rather different from flooding. It's about drought, UK drought, and also about the importance of positive water behaviours. So again, that has the, the child as the protagonist, who again is working through a year um, and is um, from periods of self-doubt and um, despondency also is uh, then helping to share their knowledge, their newfound knowledge with the school and with the community. So it's worth a look at that free copy, hard copy, if anybody's interested, it's also available online. 
Um, and Verity, do you want to say something about this one? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, and I also uh, work uh, with the RESPECT team and we've worked with um, many children uh, to develop some anti-racism resources that we know are really needed in many schools. So we've co-authored If Racism Vanished for a Day with 17 children uh, of Black and Asian um, uh, heritage um, and um, Again, this is a free resource. It's a free um, downloadable book and free uh, teaching activities, ideal for um, Black History Month, although we really support people using this uh, across the year because that's what the children wanted. Um, and if anyone, again, wants a free copy, hard copy of this, then we have got some of them and can send them out. Yeah, it's a good point about, um, you know, the seasons of the year and like Water Day, World Water Day and so on. So there is a resources that could be used in particular mm. at particular times for project work. OK, so this is the website. If you've um, found this um, this webinar interesting, hopefully you have. Um, there's more information about the project on the website. As we said, it, we're building this up as a legacy resource. So the resources there um, reflect the site that I just uh, shared a moment ago. And also, thank you very much for coming uh, today. Even if you're watching this afterwards, we we encourage you to have a look at the resource. Um, the the feedback uh, request there is really just as as you pick up the book and have a look at it. There's a we've got a Qualtrics survey which are around your initial responses to the book. Uh, we're also going to be doing a follow up evaluation with all those uh, people that we sent it out to just to see how it's being used. So we just thank you for your time today and um, yes, opportunity for any questions uh, about what we've presented. So thank you very much. Perhaps I'll stop the sharing so we can see each other. And I've just popped a link to the um, that feedback questionnaire. Yeah. So if anybody would like to do that, that'd be incredibly helpful. Well, just whilst people are having a look at that, I wanna say a massive thank you so much quality um, to those resources that people can use straight away in their schools um, in their context. So really appreciate it. Fantastic stuff. Um, as you said, I've been sharing the links to everything as we've gone into the chat so people can have a look at them. Um, but yeah, if um, anyone does have any questions, I think Yasmin was really interested in getting hard copies. Um, maybe if you just want to email me back when you um, booked there, um, Yasmin, then I can pass on um, all in one go. Anybody else who wants them rather than people bombarding you guys with them, they can do that through me and I can just send one email. So um, it's very generous that you're able to uh, provide a physical copy. Um, but appreciate it, Jasmine. She said that um, they do visual literacy uh, for year seven um, and these would be perfect. So, yeah, we can get those over to you. So, any questions at all in the chat? I'm just looking back. Well, I'm sure that if something does come to people, you'd be happy to um, answer those questions, wouldn't you, Beau? Yeah, I should um, perhaps have just said um, that I, I should have said actually on the last slide that if there is a there's an email address there, I rather I went over it a bit quickly. Um, let me just if I can just share that again. It was I think it's on. So it might not be easy to is that. Um, I can pop it in the chat. Yeah, well. it's um, if this one here um, VI, it's VIP clear. VIP, VIP clear at ue.ac.uk. Um, that is um, that would be the the, the web address. Um, sorry, the email address if you wanted to contact us directly to get some either to get a book. But I mean, it's happy. I'm really happy for Emma, Helen to act as a gatekeeper as well. And and if you've got any observations on what you've you've heard or you want to find out more, just drop us a line and we'll we'll get back to you. No, that's great. Absolutely. So thank you, Heather, as you said, it's really interesting to listen to. And um, just to echo the idea that other people within the sector might be interested. So if you've got colleagues that you think uh, couldn't make it today, do signpost them to this. The recording will be available on the SLA website so that people can watch back. Um, and just to echo once again, huge thanks to both of you. So much work has obviously gone into that. Um, and I think to get that message spread across schools is uh, really worthwhile. So. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you for your help in putting this on. Absolutely.